James and Daniel, for those who uh, haven't experienced your work, um, could you begin the conversation for us just by telling us a bit about the project Living Symphonies and maybe a bit about your careers in the run up to that time um, and the programme about to commence? I'd love to. Um, so, Living Symphonies was a touring sound installation that we created um, two and a half years ago now, wasn't it? So, summer 2014, it toured around four different forestry commission forests around um, around England from Thetford, Fine Shade, the time we come from here of course, uh, Bedgebury and Cant Chase as well in the Midlands. And the motivation behind that was a kind of it's a conjunction of both of our interests, I guess. So briefly my background was in computer science and sound, so particularly interested in the ways in which we can take systems and processes, algorithms and data and then use all of this kind of complex digital stuff as a way to compose music and to, to kind of learn about the way in which we ourselves as humans make music. Um, I, I come from a slightly different background, I guess. Um, so I grew up studying classical music, studying composition, and had that kind of route probably till I came to London at uh, 18 or 19, um, came to Goldsmiths, uh, started work there really in, as an artist in effect and started kind of looking at making work and particularly became very captivated by why we didn't progress beyond mono and, mono and stereo in the way we listen and became very interested in making sort of spatialized pieces, um, kind of landscape pieces. And then uh, we met in showing in a similar exhibition and started kind of challenging each other and arguing about things and thinking about what we could make that would kind of prove some of the things that were bothering us about uh, the way particularly that sound is exhibited um, and we made a piece called Variable 4 in Dungeness uh, which we'll probably pass around a couple of kind of leaflets about some of these pieces that we brought with us um, but Variable 4 is basically a, a, a piece that is driven in real time by weather conditions so it exists outside, it's an installation um, and you hear the music change based on how the weather conditions are changing mm. second by second so every kind of parameter of the weather is measured. Um, and over time, uh, we've installed that piece five or six times. And as Daniel mentioned, Living Symphonies kind of came after that as a kind of much bigger progression, and also because we're both so interested in the natural world and ecology. <coughs> yeah, so, so the story behind Variable 4 then was taking this kind of, you know, the patterns of tension and resolution and unpredictable but kind of familiar structures that you get within weather systems. So you get, you know, a build-up of air pressure, you get this rainfall, and we became interested in the ways in which you can take those patterns and turn them into music. And when we started speaking to the Forestry Commission and Sound and Music, who were the other partners in Living Symphonies about forest ecosystems, we realised that this is kind of like the, the most glorious kind of conjunction of all the ideas that we've become interested in, in uh, emergence, for example, the ways in which you get these complex coordinated holes like the, the entirety of a forest with all this incredible structure and seeming creativity like the way that the organisms within the forest have been designed but there, there isn't a coordinator clearly I mean it's, it's the you know the product of millions of years of evolution and these interactions and you know co kind of selfish and hostile behaviors on behalf of all of these individuals that live within the forest but creates this incredible interlocking system that comes out of it and we started kind of seeing conjunctions within, uh, you know, symphonic form, the ways in which you compose a piece of music that's comprised of all these interlocking parts and, again, has, you know, tension resolution and uh, conflict and so forth, but on a scale that kind of was light years ahead of what we'd been thinking about with Variable 4, really, in that you can start to think about an organism or a species within the forest as a player or as an ensemble, and then you can start to write music for those organisms and then as a whole you get a composition which emerges from all these different parts that goes through cycles of day and night and it has individuals interacting, you know, breathing, moving, searching for food, mating, etc. etc. And out of that comes this symphony. So that was the idea. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I mean how deep would you like us to go? We can we can take you through the process of how, how it was produced and so forth. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, I suppose, the start of the journey in terms of Living Symphonies, what it was that really inspired you and where that led you to do the four different sites around the UK. 
So I think um, one of the things that we probably haven't mentioned is that we p the very first thing we did when we kind of got together um, was, was a variable for installation. Um, and I can't remember exactly why, but uh, a conversation came up where we thought about the experience of um, listening to site-specific sound works and how commonly you would listen to them in a gallery space that wouldn't be appropriate, really, for that sort of way of listening. Mostly they're visual art spaces, and they're built with that in mind. So sound work tends to kind of struggle in those scenarios. Um, so we thought a lot about that, and we thought a lot about the journey that someone has uh, to get to a piece and what they experience before they get there. Um, and we alighted upon this, I, it seemed fairly insane at the time, this idea of doing an installation on Dungeness Beach in Kent. Um, and because we both l love the area, it's a beautiful site and a very interesting site to work within. Uh, so we kind of just went ahead and did that um, and got in contact with all the relevant people to gain permission to do it. And we were lucky to uh, get an award from the PRS to make that installation happen. Um, but I think that led us to realise that working in quite remote places and that sense of journey to get to these locations uh, is a really brilliant thing and can be bound up in the concept of the work. Um, and also, as Dan was mentioning, I think we also kind of alighted quite easily upon this notion that we've started to call live composition, which is that the pieces that we make are not static linear pieces. They constantly change. So if you, for example, take a seven-note melody, the way that we record that seven-note melody is in tiny fragments so that they can change dependent on the condition. So humidity might go up and extra notes would be introduced to the melody. And when you extrapolate that across many, many things playing all at the same time and have a kind of harmonic system binding it together, you have a piece that constantly changes but can retain a sense of form and harmony. And I think we did that quite naturally to solve the problem of how to work with real-time weather conditions. Mm. But that really, really informed the way that this piece came about and Living Symphonies was really a kind of culmination of all of those ideas, in effect. Mm. So the, the concrete next steps from that then, we started um, speaking to the Forestry Commission about working together to create this project. And the big question was how we can portray each of these forest ecosystems differently within this kind of sound installation concept. So the goal was to make a piece of music that is installed, as it were, within the forest that takes all these ideas of non-linear composition and self-organisation. But it's essentially, for the, from the point of view of the visitor, it is as if the music is emerging from the forest, basically. You walk into the forest and you hear these sounds emerging from the trees, played from speakers and played in real time as well. It's not, as James said, it's not a recording. It is music that is being generated by the system. But we wanted to create it in such a way that it both responds to the site, but is the same piece of music, it has the same spirit to it, it's built from the same parts, just as every forest I is grown from the same parts, you know, you get commonalities, fungus and moss and birds of prey and so forth, but we wanted to represent each site um, differently in its uniqueness. And the way in which we did this was by working really closely with ecologists and wildlife rangers from the Forestry Commission, going to each site one by one and then studying the forest in depth, so we spent a good number of um, weeks, like, going back and forth to each of the forest sites and starting to understand for ourselves really what makes each of these forests different because I mean when we first started we you know we, we would have been hard pressed to understand the difference between the kind of birch heath and the canic chase and then the ancient woodland of fine shade but after we started to work with these ecologists we understood the sites better and then we realized that we'd have to go that little bit deeper select a location within each forest that kind of exemplifies what <coughs> gives it its character and then look at it really closely, which meant doing a survey, metre by metre, um, of a particular area of each forest, 30 metres across by 20 metres, so quite a, quite a space. Um, but, you know, in small enough for us to understand it, but big enough for you to be able to walk through it and feel like you're exploring different areas effectively. So we then worked uh, with these ranges and with a whole, well, a whole load of different volunteer groups, basically, to survey each of these forest areas looking at you know, how much moss there is here, how much fungus there is there, how, what species you're likely to see passing through this area of the forest over a particular time period. And importantly as well, the weather conditions that were likely to take place as well. So, you know, is it quite sheltered? Are you going to get rain? Are there parts that are exposed and so forth? And so by doing so, we built up a kind of portrait of, this, of each of these different forest areas, which we then encoded within a 
computer model, basically. So what we did was replicated the real-life forest within a kind of virtual forest, which follows as closely as we could the exact behaviours of things you'd see in the forest. So if it's a sunny day, our kind of small computer model of the forest will represent the fact that it's sunny by you know, placing birds of prey overhead that will be swooping, or the thermals that we might get, um, you know, birds uh, coming out, singing in the trees, and this kind of thing. But the goal of making this model was so that we could then turn this portrayal of the forest into a musical portrayal, which was the big next step. Yeah. So we, we also, along, alongside talking to the ecologists, we had to do a lot of um, quite in-depth research, I guess, um, academically, really, to understand uh, the behavioural characteristics of the moving creatures and how things change over time. Um, and also we very swiftly began to realise that the surveys needed to take place as close as possible to us actually doing the installation because forest sites change incredibly quickly in ways that you don't realise until you survey a site twice and see that tree's just gone and this has rotted away and there's a whole new separate mini ecosystem there that exists. Um, so we kind of took all of that into account. Um, what we ended up with was four very in-depth surveys of these sites, which allowed us to uh, basically end up with about 115 separate organisms across the four sites. So it's important to note that we didn't uh, distinguish between every single type of beetle. We kind of made a collective there and said beetles, and the same for grass and, and various other things that you can imagine, in order to keep it realistic. Um, and attainable as a thing to write, basically. Um, so we ended up with these 110 odd organisms, um, each of which uh, had its own composition scored out initially. Um, so written as kind of conventional notation, but written in such a way um, that a player could come in and play it and play many, many hundreds of small fragments that could be combined together uh, to create a kind of non-linear generative version of that. And the four movements, um, depended very much on the characteristics of that organism. Um, so for a butterfly, you had uh, a static uh, movement, you had a feeding movement, um, a flying movement, and I think a mating movement for that. So a butterfly in that instance um, was bowed cello harmonics, um, used a lot of sort of bark counterpoint techniques in the way that it would generate. Um, so it was bowed cello harmonics because of uh, so it's a slight nod to the physicality of it. Um, so there is a kind of slightly poetic interpretation there, but also because functionally, bowed cello harmonics fly very well across the space. Um, and so you, the butterfly as a, uh, oh, and the other thing to mention, sorry, this is quite a tricky thing to explain without uh, uh, imagery of any kind, but it's good. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing to try and explain it like this. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that when the installation was live, we monitored real-time weather conditions to control the simulation. So you would know that it became sunny at a certain moment, and so the butterfly motifs would appear. And you would already know from the simulation we've built that there are flowers in certain areas that those butterflies would like to feed on. So when the butterfly came into the simulation, you would hear it fly across the space, and it might stop and change to its eating motif when it came uh, across a flower, for example. So what that involved was a lot of recording sessions with a lot of musicians. I think we had some 50 odd uh, different musicians um, and many, many hours of sessions to record it. So, and a lot of that kind of took place along the period of time while we were surveying and working on the simulations as well, because as we learned things, we began composing things. Um, but what we ended up with was 110 separate pieces of music where we knew exactly what every note was within them. Um, so we could have all of those pieces of music interact together um, within the forest area where it was going to be heard. So we've got to this point then in the story in which we've understood all the different species within the site and we've created these real-time portraits of the forest and we've written the music for each of these species. And the final piece was to actually go out there and install all of this technology within the forest to kind of realise the installation. And, I mean, this was the bit that we had no experience <laughs> with whatsoever, so we were completely at the mercy of all these amazing uh, tree surgeons and uh, rangers and all the Forestry Commission staff from the different forests. 
and it took about a week at a time to put all of this hardware in because it's not it's not just a matter of taking a speaker and putting it in a tree you need to run a cable down the tree through the undergrowth 100 meters away to a trailer which had you know racks of computing equipment in and this kind of thing and to do all of this in a way that's sympathetic to the ecosystem so we didn't want to be disturbing uh, any rare species so we worked with the forestry commission to understand you know sensitive areas we had to do it in a way which was reasonably invisible so that people weren't going to be tripping over cables and in a way that was going to stand up to a, well a week's worth of being outside so that was another big feat of <laughs> determination um, and willpower but after several days of running these cables installing speakers here yeah, some of these were what, 30 meters up trees installed with cherry pickers and tree climbers and all of this stuff and finally we got to the point where we had all of this infrastructure within the trees and we could start to turn it on for the first time and hear what it was like and I mean it was an amazing experience for us because we you can hear each of these bits of music in the studio and you can listen to it in situ but it's so different when you're listening out in the forest because you're not just hearing these pieces of music um, you're hearing them all together intertwining but you're also hearing them as modulated by the wind so as the wind moves through the trees you're actually hearing the sound move with the wind as well and of course you're hearing the background sound um, of all of the you know the songbirds in the trees and the trees rustling and other bits of flora and fauna and so forth and so to us it seemed that it was maybe that we'd never really heard the piece completely before the moment we had it installed within the forest um, and so that was quite a quite an epiphany really because then it gave us a lot of thinking and work to do in that we would be sat there listening to the work like trying to trying to mix it and mixing a piece of music which is the you know the process of trying to combine all the musical elements it's complex enough a process as it is let alone when you've got the forest and the unpredictability of the weather conditions controlling what you're hearing at the same time so um yeah we spent a long time um listening and focusing but i think yeah it was quite a quite a transformative moment i think being able to finally put this thing um out in the forest so we, we ended up with, um, we alighted upon the kind of notion of having 24 speakers in total over these 30 by 20 metre areas. So there were speakers on the ground um, embedded uh, and hidden there. There were speakers at kind of head height and then a range of speakers across the canopy, which enabled us basically, in effect, to place sound anywhere within that 30 by 20 metre area and to move sound anywhere, um, which was quite a revelation for us because the other thing is I mean, our studio isn't the size of that forest. So to be able to hear sound in a space like that. And we, we, we actually prototyped it in a much smaller form at Thetford Forest the year before, which we learned a lot from. Still, um, it, it was still completely different and uh, uh, quite a revelation when we heard it for the first time in 24 Channel um, at Thetford again the year later, because we developed it so much. Um, but yeah, it was a really... Uh, astounding thing. One thing we did learn from the Thetford experience, which um, was great, we worked with Neil Armicello, who's the ecologist for East, uh, East of England, a lot on the piece, and he was a great guide for us, in effect. So one of the things we did within the piece, and there's quite a few kind of little tweaks we made to the composition, was to remove any frequency of sound within the birdsong range, so that we wouldn't interrupt any kind of uh, birdsong communication going on. And there are a number of things like that that you only really learn by being there and by talking to people who have spent a lot of time in that location who notice that squirrels' behaviours have changed because you've put a speaker right next mm. to the dray or, or whatever. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was just incredible. And the Forestry Commission gave us such a huge amount of their time and uh, expertise, really, as did all the local volunteer groups and... Uh, I mean, some of the information we got from people who just spend a lot of time in those areas of forest and have a huge amount of knowledge about where nesting birds are, things like that was just completely vital to us. And we would never have been able to understand that on, on our own, in effect. And the, the other really rewarding thing, of course, was how people then engaged with it. And for, for us, if you show works in more traditional gallery spaces, you kind of get the same traditional gallery audiences and so forth. And so it was quite, um, I don't know, putting, putting a sound work, a work of what is effectively quite an experimental piece of sound out in a forest means that you get quite untraditional audiences coming to see it. You get people who are out 
uh, walking their dogs or out for a bike ride or just out for a play or whatever, who'd be walking through the forest and then hear the sound and go, what's going on here? And then would go down and start to engage with the work and then use it kind of as a, stri- as a springboard, basically, as a way to understand, well, both the way that this piece of music was working but also the forest as well. So people started to listen to certain pieces of the composition and kind of go, oh, you know, is that, is that a butterfly? Is that... Um, a moth, is it a, a bird of prey, something like this, and then start to look a little bit more deeply at the ecosystem itself. And I think for us that's always been one of the kind of underlying motivations within our work as well. It's not just about creating this piece of music, it's about creating a way of giving people a perspective back onto the environment and maybe allowing them to kind of reflect on it and see it in a slightly different way than they had done <coughs> before. Well, I'm afraid we don't have the 24 channel set up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with the speaker that you've put on, which oh, yeah, of course. that's a really good point. Why is the recording? Yeah, so we've got a couple of sound recordings. So, um, what, as we explained, so each different piece of instrumentation within this recording, maybe we'll get, get a chance to play a couple of recordings, they're only about a minute long. Um, but if you listen out, each different piece of instrumentation represents a different species within the forest, and then collectively you'll hear them kind of harmonise and generate counterpoints and polyrhythms between them. So in this one, so as not to talk over it, there is uh, the core sort of uh, strong violin motif within, this is Canic Chase, I think it looks like, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is Canic Chase, which is very dom- is in Birch's Valley, so it's very dominated by a whole set of silver birch trees in effect. Um, and this was a point after it had just rained, I think, early evening. Um, so the trees are very active um, within the simulation. So the dominant thing here is silver birch, which is the, uh, uh, it's actually a string quartet, but I'm not sure you'll hear the whole quartet within this. Um, and then in the background there is uh, magpie, which is a kind of a nod to sort of Victorian automatic instruments. Um, so it's built in that way as a mechanical magpie within the composition. So it's not all conventional classical music in in the way you might think um and then there's holly uh deadwood and frog as well i think in the background which i'll let you work out what it is <laughs> So that was recorded as a, a, a kind of straight field recording using a stereo microphone. It's a very, very difficult piece to record because uh, from one end to the other it sounds completely different, so you can't really record it properly. Um, nor would I think we really want to, um, but it's quite useful to have uh, recordings. Mm. Um, there was actually quite a few other things going on <coughs> there. There was a kind of mouse in the background, I think, <laughs> um, and some other bits and pieces. We've also got a short um, segment of Thetford Forest that perhaps we could quickly listen to for kind of contrast between the two. Um, so this is a 30 second segment of it and this was a more, so this was bordered by pine trees um, slightly earlier in the year so it was a bit more verdant. Um, there are, our notes don't actually have the species that are present here so you have to use your imagination. I'll try and describe them afterwards. <laughs> So 
the hang drum motif, which is a sort of inverted steel drum, is worms, um, which I imagine is because it was raining, um, which is a, it's a nice, easy one, actually, for people when they're there to kind of identify. Uh, I think the main motif there is that ash tree in the mm. corner. Um, yeah. And I can't remember the rest. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of lose track after a while with, with so many, yeah. in a way. My background, oh, uh, well, if I start with a sort of follow on, really, I'm really impressed with it. I'm, I'm just imagining what you could have done with Ashwell Thorpe Lower Wood, which is where I've been a volunteer. It's a, it's, it's a, a, a nature reserve owned by the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, and it's an ancient woodland um, about 10 miles south of Norwich. Um, and its, it's, it's, it's name, Ashwell Thorpe, comes from the Vikings for whom the ash tree was sacred in Norse mythology. The giant ash tree, Eldrassil, was looked after by some Viking goddesses, Norse goddesses, the Norns. The three Norns used to pour holy mud and water on the ash tree's boughs to keep it healthy. And you know, since the advent of ash dieback, we could really do with some of those Norns right now. <laughs> anyway, it's an ancient. It's, it's an ancient woodland. It probably was there after the last ice age. It came after the last ice age, and the size, you know, it's nothing compared to um, the Fermin Woods here. It's 37 hectares. Anyone who feels old money, it's about the same size as Winnie the Pooh's hundred-acre wood. Um, and you know, these ancient woodlands, you can't. You can plant trees. You can't plant an ancient woodland because. The important thing goes on underneath the ground that you can't see. All the fungal, the mycorrhiza interacting with all the trees, the, the, the fungus um, hitching up. They, all the trees know which are the good fungi, which are the bad fungi, and they use them to take minerals. And the, 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 this woodland, Ashwell Thorpe Lower Wood, it was mentioned in the Doomsday Book in 1068. Was that written? We know from then, but probably a long time before then, it's been managed by this ancient form of um, forestry known as coppicing. I don't know if you know what coppicing is. It involves cutting down trees to the ground, to, to the ground, and, um, and it was obviously it was like a Stone Age man, I think, who, who discovered that actually if you cut, cut a tree down and it came up as multiple shoots, you actually got more for your money than if you'd left the tree stand as just one shoot. The other advantage, so it was, it was like continuous, it, they, they, the coppicing evolved because it provided this continuous source of um, timber and, and fuel for, um, and, and materials for building things. Um, but it also had this huge benefit for the tree because it prolongs the life of the tree. Uh, a, a single ash tree, if you let it go to a, um, a single stem, might live 300 years or something. A coppiced ash can go on for 1,000 a thousand years. As another advantage, while well, they didn't coppice a whole woodland, they did it in small blocks on a rotation. So you cut out a small block, maybe a hectare, we try to do a hectare a year, lets in light um, so that uh, ground flora can pop up because if you go into a wood, actually a dark, overgrown wood, nothing's much growing on the, on the, on the floor, but you, you let a patch of light in, you get rare plants coming up. And we have plants in Ashworth Wood that are complete, uh, very ancient plants, and they are completely adapted to the coppicing regime. You won't get them anywhere else. There's some really, really interesting plants that are only there because of the coppicing. And originally, I think the, the, the wood, play, you know, um, the nearest town is Wyndham, and um, it, was, it was very important for the rural economy, medieval Wyndham. If you, th there's an, there, was a, there was an old farmer that used to write, it was kind of like the Samuel Pepys of Wyndham, um, was, I'm trying, Randall Burroughs, he wrote his diary, it was a farming, it wasn't a very exciting diary, 1786, he describes going to the wood to get what he calls nuttery faggots. These were bunch of bundles of coppiced hazel that he used for, for, ver for, ver for various um, jobs around the farm. And in 1796, a score, I think a score is... 20 isn't it i think a score a score of nuttery faggots cost him two shillings and sixpence and you know i tried to look back 
in, 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 how much, what was that? What was that really worth? I mean, two shillings and six was. I'd be difficult to tell you what that was worth now, let alone in in, in the late eighteenth century. And if you look back, what else could you get for two shillings and six months in seventeen ninety six? You could get a whole pig. You could get your tooth extracted from the dentist. You could get dinner for the entire family in the local tavern, including bread and ale. These were valuable things. And and I think over the years, you know. We just don't value our woodlands enough. All the, all the trees had a different role. It was very important. And originally, the whole of Asheville thought would have been under coppice rotation. Every bit of it would have been cut around that time. And the, and the coppicing went on, amazingly, right up until the 70s, when the co-op brush factory owned the wood. And they used to get the handles for, for, yeah, for brushes and for um, agricultural in instruments. You know, come the 70s, who used a brush? In the who, uh, we all went over to using what are those dreadful things called? The Electrolux and the Hoover. The brushes went out of fashion. The coppice blocks, were, they weren't economic anymore. The whole wood went into decline. But the trust knew the value of the wood, long since val it recognised its value. It was, it was designated a triple SI, a site of special scientific interest, mainly because of the um, ground flora. Yeah, um, and they, they bought it in 1992. And... I th I've been, I've been uh, helping out since then to restore the coppice blocks to their whole glory, their former glory. And, you know, we, the, the, it's, a, it's slightly different now because the whole wood is not coppiced. Around the outside is what's known as the wild wood. We don't do anything there. If a tree falls, it's just left. It's, um, it, 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 it increases the biodiversity. It's a really important area all around the world. It's a buffer against the agricultural land that surrounds Ashwell Thorpe. But it also increases the um, biodiversity. It's important for recycling. Um, and there you go in. It's a very dark area. This time of year, it'd be quite dark. And, you know, the old coppice, um, if, you, if you're neglected, we call it the neglected coppice, eventually they push themselves apart and you get these enormous um, limbs crashing down. I've been there and heard this huge crash. I don't know, that, so, 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 was it one of the philosophers, was it, oh, I can't, someone help me out now, if a tree falls in the wood, does it make me not? Well, I can say yes, it does, but <laughs> it ruins it because I was there and I heard it. You get these crashing down as they push themselves apart and you get the most fantastic fungi. This year, it's been a particularly good year for chicken of the woods. You get these chicken of the woods years, which go on, on, I don't know if you've ever seen a chicken of the woods. Have you ever seen a chicken of the woods? Oh, they love oak trees and it starts as a small, almost like a little rose and it grows out of the base of the chicken. It's supposed to be very good for eating a huge yellow rosette. And then some, uh, something similar to that, not quite as impressive, well, it's still quite impressive. Hen of the woods, All, and that was a really—it was a really good year for hen of the woods. You get these florets almost that are growing out the base of the old oak trees, and the hen of the woods attracts a fly. It's called the fungus gnat, and you get no, nothing at this time in the winter. Come on, who's you know, all, no flies about. Yet all the flies are attracted to hen of the woods, and you can see it got absolutely fantastic. Also, about all the other the stink horns. The, um, the fly agarics, the ink caps, they're all there in the wood. The trooping funnel. If you, ever, if you ever come across trooping funnel, you can follow it. It's all one fungus, but if you can follow it trooping. There's a funnel. And it goes out through the trees. And you know, these fungus are really, really important to the trees. They are breaking down, nutri breaking down leaves and giving nutrients back to the trees. And in return, the trees give them some of their sugars and th things that they make from photosynthesis. There's this huge symbiosis that you cannot recreate. If you think, oh, I'm going to change that field into it, I'm going to plant some trees now, put a little wood in this field. You can't do it because what's going, what the most important thing is under the ground, what's going on there, a whole world that we know so little about under the ground. And occasionally the fungi will put up these fantastic fruiting bodies. The only reason you know they're there, this, these fruiting bodies. And then you get these, you know, I mean, the fly agaric, it produces all these compounds that you know you can't recreate in the in the in the, in the lab or the chemist. These fantastic hallucinogenic compounds that you know nothing else. I think there's only the, it, 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 they're made famous by um, Lewis Carroll in Al Alice in Wonderland when you know the the, the you know, she takes a little bit of the flyer Garrick and suddenly everything's big or everything's small and stuff. But um, those compounds that that fly agaric makes. It's only ever been found in two other places. I think I'm right here. This is in the poison glands of some exotic tree frog in the Amazon and in the brains of schizophrenics. Who knew? 
That's it, just incredible. And the fungus, the fungus make, why does the fungus make? Who knows? What does it do? Who knows what it does? But, um, but it was, you know, okay, Lewis Carroll took, the, took, took all the credit for the fly. Gary, it was the <laughs> Vikings that found out first, because there was a tribe of Vikings, they were called the Berserks, and they used to nibble on a fly agaric to um, whip them up into a frenzy before going into battle. What do we get from that? Going berserk. It stays with us today. 600, from 600 right up, to, what's that? Almost 2,000, no, no uh, one and a half thousand years, the berserks have lived on via the fly agaric. And then there was, um, you know, there's all these connotations with Christmas and the fly agaric. Do you know the story about the Christmas? It, it originated from um, Siberia. Uh, 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 800 Siberia and the shaman, the religious men, were the only um, people in the village that were allowed to t partake of the fly agaric because it gave them super supernatural powers. And um, they used to, that the red, uh, do we know that fly agaric, the red, it was a red cap and the white spots, and they used to nibble on that and it used to be, make them very benevolent. So they used to take presents round to the poor peasants that weren't allowed to partake of the fly agaric. But the peasants, they were living in little tents. They didn't have doors. They only had chimneys to, for, for their smoke to go up. So the, so the shaman went down the chimney to, develop, to, to, to give them presents. Come on, Christmas. <laughs> and the red, the red of the fly agaric was the Santa suit and, and the red and white. And, um, but of course, you know, the peasants, they wanted the fly agaric, so they weren't allowed to have it, but nothing could stop the reindeer taking the fly agaric, <laughs> and hence the Rudolph and his flying friends. They'd <laughs> nibbled on the hallucinogenic fungus. And, um, and, uh, but s s suddenly, some, some, although they weren't allowed to partake, these, these um, psychedelic substances, they're not metabolised by, the, by the body. They pass right through. So some bright peasant realised that you could get the same, you could get the same effect by partaking of the yellow snow from the, <laughs> the reindeer's yellow snow. Unfortunately, all this um, changed when the Russians invaded Siberia and they introduced vodka. But, um, yeah, you know, th th then you know, they were, there was no, no, no need to partake of the yellow snow. But what's the phrase that, I don't know sure I can say this in polite company, to get pissed. It stays with us today. <laughs> That's where it came from, the yellow snow, to get pissed. That, that was it. So I, I've lost my track now. Oh, I'm talking about fungus. <laughs> Back to the wood. It's fantastic. And, and you get some really quite delicious fungi. In the spring, we get the morel in, in the wood. And you've got to get there before the deer love the morel and they take, they, 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 they'll eat it. But you've got to be careful because as well <laughs> as the delicious, tasty chicken of the woods and the morel, you get the deadly poisonous as well. The... Um, the death cap, I think the, the, <coughs> the clue's in the name, is the fungus that's taken out more, it's ca caused more deaths than any other fungus. It's like two holy Roman empire, uh, emperors died of partaking of the, of, of the death cap. But why is it, well, you know, th these, these substances, people have looked at it and, it and it's just like this deadly poison. You can't, there's no antidote. Why is the fungus making it? Who knows? But it's just these fantastically complicated um, fungi. And then you get these beautiful brackets on the, dis on the, on the, on the, on the dead trunks. The fungus is recycling the wood. It's producing chemicals that the paper industry pay a fortune for to to to, um, to recreate, to break down, you know, in pulping, in paper recycling. But the fungus is doing it with no problem at all. You know, it's just there, and doing it. And in the uh, dark this time of year, in the in the woodland, but come the spring, no leaves on the trees. You get all you get swathes of um, beautiful bluebells, so massive bluebells, um, <coughs> and at the same time, so, w a plant that loves the s exactly the same areas as the bluebells, the wild garlic, the ramsons. We have carpets of wild garlic, but you never get garlic and bluebell growing together intermixed. They both love the same conditions, but you have garlic here, you have bluebell there. What's going on there? There's some sort of antagonism, but these are ancient plants and they're all kind of sort of steeped, seeped, seeped in folklore. The garlic, you know, it was a cure-all for any, everything from rheumatism to asthma. The bluebell, it was a medieval cure for snake bite. And even now, the bulbs, the, 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 the English bluebell, produces all these really, really interesting compounds. I think the University of Aberystwyth was looking at them as potential um, cancer treatment. There's the bluebell making these things to stop other creatures 
um, probably eating it, I don't know. There's all these insecticides and herbicides that the bluebell makes and it can keep the garlic at bay and probably vice versa. There they are, then there's this fantastic ancient plant that lives, also lives amongst the bluebells, the yellow archangel. And if you've ever looked in um, Culpepper's herbal, 18th century herbal, You'll, you'll, it's, uh, Culpepper described the archangel as an exhilarating herb that lifted the heart. And we know now it's packed full of um, antidepressants, naturally occurring antidepressants. There it is in the woodland. We move out of the dark. Oh, I've forgotten the birds. You've got the woodpeckers, the owls. We have the beautiful little owl. He was saying about birds nesting, you can guarantee where the little owls will be. They've got their favourite tree, their oak tree. They're in there every year. And you can come out and you see three little baby owl, oh, little owls lined up waiting for their food to come. We have tawnies, we have um, barn owls, and we have woodpeckers. I was really, we have the spot, we used to have the greater spotted, a bit rare now, lesser spotted woodpecker. We have the green woodpecker. I was really, really lucky, really lucky at the end of this summer to see the rare dance of the green woodpecker. This is the most, um, what's the word, uh, civilised territorial display you will ever come across. It was two males on a branch and arguing over the territory. And, it, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was a dance. There was no contact. They were shuffling and uh, there was a lot of beak displaying. It was just fantastic. I stood there thinking, oh, well, God, I've never seen this before in my life. And look up, is this the rare dance of the green woodpecker? And finally, the loser did a spiral out of the tree and collapsed on the floor. It was fine. It wasn't hurt. It just said, OK, <laughs> that's it. It's yours now. I'm off. It was just this fantastic thing. And you, if you emerge out of the, um, the, the wild wood, the, the paths in the, the rides, we call them rides, the footpaths uh, that crisscross the wood, they are managed like you would uh, manage a meadow. They're mowed a couple of times a year and you get plants there that you don't find anywhere else. You know, the centauri, the beautiful, it's like it's, it's a rel relative of the gentian and they're sunny they're, they're because they're sunny rides and you get all the beautiful butterflies. You mentioned the butterflies. Now, oh, okay, I'm in the Fermin Woods. I don't even know I should mention butterflies. You've got the purple emperor here. OK, I raise you. We've got the white admiral. It's the, uh, the Britain's only gliding butterfly. It's, a big, it's so well named. The white admiral is mostly black. It's this fantastic <laughs> black. It's got a little bit of white, but that's on the top. Underneath, when it closes up, a fantastic pat. Oh, I forgot my handouts. The fantastic <laughs> pattern. There's the black top of the black. Here's the underside of the of the of the white admiral. It doesn't. This picture doesn't really give it. You've got to get it in in the right light. And that's because the pigments in the butterfly. They're not pigment pigments. They're not colours. They are scales. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's the way they're orientated that gives off these fantastic colours. I think you've probably, I don't, I'm going to ruin it now by not having one, but I think I have. Yes, I think we've all got this, um, you know, the chip, and, the chip and pin thing. That's the, in, the, the, the butterflies are the inspiration for this uh, chip and pin. That, yeah, mine's not very, hologram, that's the word, couldn't get it, hologram, yeah, exactly. Comes from butterflies, fantastic. And we have about, I don't know, something like 27 species of butterfly. This is our, um, our, our, um, our pièce de la résistance. But we have lots of other beautiful butterflies that come down the rides. And then you can move into the coppice blocks. The coppice blocks are unique. They are, there are plants there I say, you will not find anywhere else. My all-time favorite, oh, how to, can I, am I allowed to have a favorite? I don't know. The Herb Paris. The Herb Paris. I hope I've got, oh, Herb Paris, here. It's an ancient plant. Um, this is Herb Paris. It's an ancient plant. It has no other close relative in the UK. It can only grow in coppice blocks. And par nothing to do with the French capital, but from the Latin, par, for paired. It's got paired leaves, four leaves, paired sepals. And inside that blackberry, 
four seeds, pairs of seeds, but occasionally you get these mutations. We've got ones with three leaves, we've got ones with five, we've got ones with seven. And so, as it's a really ancient, if you apparently you've had them in your woodland, you were saved from witchcraft. You were never going to be visited by witches. It, 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 it protected you against uh, unruly behaviour by witchcraft. And if you ate the berry, it was supposed to keep your hair from grow from it was supposed to keep your hair black. It stopped you from growing grey. I should have had a few more, I think, in my time. But ag again, it makes um, quite. It, they're all. They're all. All these plants have so much folklore. This one, it was supposed to be. You could overdose on herb Paris. It was supposed to be um, lethal. An odd combination: children and chickens. It could kill, kill children and chickens if you. <laughs> but the antidote was a strong cup of coffee. Who knew? Fantastic plant. And then again, at the same time as the herb Paris, the orchids, the early purple orchids. You know, these, these be they look beautiful, but they're such a lazy plant. Their seed is like dust. They cannot germinate unless you've got the right fungi in the soil to feed them. And whereas the trees always give something back, the orchids, they don't give anything back. They just take. They take from the fungus. And when the seeds have germinated, another fungus has to move in to help the adult plant because it doesn't do any, it doesn't do much in the way of photosynthesis. Hasn't got much in the way of leaves. Um, we have the early purple orchid. We have the tway blade, which is another orchid. Um, not much to write home with, home about florally, but has these enormous tway, Middle English for two, two huge broad leaves because it has to do get its flowering over and done with before the trees get their their leaves back. It's a, um, huge broad leaves and then these funny spikes um, color yellow you could miss it easily it's not really a very attractive flower but it's an orchid it's you know it's it's, it's still and then you get the beautiful wood anemones um, the wind flowers and the early p um, spring plants and they uh, they they turn towards the sun in the morning to, to get the maximum amount of, of sunlight and they warm up and you see all the insects going the the, the um, cold-blooded um, invertebrates going to warm themselves up on the on the, on the on the on the flowers of the wooden enemies, and another really big favourite of mine. Do you know the lords and ladies, the arum lily, another ancient plant. Do you know that part. It's got all sorts of funny um, nicknames. Parsons in the pulpit. It's got. Um, I think it makes this incredibly unusual starch. So it does its <laughs> photosynthesis and it stores this starch down in the base of it. Um, and uh, um, when, wh and wh why does it need that? Because when it uh, uh, flowers to it, it, it needs flies to, 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 to pollinate it. It needs to attract flies. So it has to produce the smell of rotting meat. And how does it do that? It mobilizes its starch and it, produ it, 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 it synthesizes these unique aromas of rotting meat. But it has to um, make them volatile. It has to heat itself up. So the smell goes out into the air. And it, hop, it does this for three days a year at half past four in the afternoon. Half past four, it mobilizes its starch. And the temperature, if you stuck a thermometer into the plant, you would see its temperature rising from 17 degrees C, which is like the ambient, to 32 degrees C. And it takes half an hour to do that. It raises the temperature. The, the chemicals, and it holds that temperature without any deviation for one hour. It's just completely fair. It is much better, much more efficient than any man-made thermostat ever known. It's just one hour. It does. How does it do it? Nobody knows. It does that half past four to half past five every day for three days until the flies come, pollinate it. And the starch, again, that's if it gets the chance, because the deer love that starch. It's a very tasty starch, and they'll bite it off if... Um, yeah. Okay, the coppice block. And then, of course, the coppice blocks. Where would the coppice blocks be without the trees? The, the, fa the, the trees, what do, we, what do we coppice? Hazel, classic coppice. Um, there used to be so many uses for the coppice hazel. Um, fencing, all sorts of basketry. And, you know, the, the, the forked hazel, they used to use them for <coughs> water divining. It's very important, water divining. All sorts of uses for the hazel. The, the, the ash, the best firewood. Ash, what was it called? Ash, you can burn it green. You don't have to um, um, season it. It has very, very low moisture. You can just chuck it on the fire and what you get? Ash. 
but it was also very useful for agricultural hand uh, implements, farming implements, very strong but bendy. And then we have the fantastic hornbeam, a beautiful tree, a very, very hard wood. They used to use it for butchers chopping blocks and cogs in for, for watches um, because it's so hard. And the hornbeam plays host to our rarest orchid in the wood, the bird's nest orchid, the laziest orchid in the country. It doesn't even bother with its photosynthesis anymore. Bird's nest, because if you, if you would, no, I'm not recommending it, I'm not, I'm not advising it, if you would dig, dig it up, you would see just a mass of roots and it taps in to the hornbeam. It taps into the hornbeam's mycorrhizal fungus and it steals things. It doesn't bother with photosynthesis, so it's flower, it looks dead. It's gone away, it's done away with chlorophyll, it doesn't bother, it's just a brown spike. It doesn't even bother to flower every year. <laughs> Maybe once every seven years, it brings up a spike. And then we have to keep its location very, very quiet because the orchid hunters, was a shame, but um, seven, I think seven spikes was our, our, our um, maximum. And you know, the hornbeam, if you look in any of the reference books, text, it'll tell you, Bird's nest orchid is so always associated with beech. We don't have beech in Ashwell Thorpe, but we have the hornbeam. No, I don't, I'm trying to find anywhere else that has bird's nest orchid associated with hornbeam. Fantastic tree. And then our older, plateau older tree is one of our triple, S, uh, triple SI notifications. The older, it's really unusual to have older growing in a woodland. In Norfolk, certainly we have what we call older car, it grows in the wet round the broads. That's where you get older. You don't get older in a woodland, but the older is there. It's a very wet woodland. The soil is it's, it's very heavy clay, South Norfolk clay, but there's uh, over, overlaid with um, uh, sandy uh, sand, and it's very um, nutrient poor. But the older, what does the older do? It employs a bacteria called Frankia. It takes the bacteria out of the soil. It, it makes a little it makes a little house around its roots. Takes the bacteria, captures the bacteria. The bacteria not getting back out, and the bacteria take nitrogen from the air, from uh, the uh, from the environment, the atmosphere, and it converts it into nitrogen fertilizer for the tree. And in the turn, the tree gives the bacteria some of its photosynthesis, some of its photosynthesis, but the older wood is just incredible. The older wood has a very unusual chemistry. If you cut a bit of older and throw it into um, a, a pool of water, the outside hardens, and, but the whole thing floats. It change, somehow changes its um, chemistry when it falls into water, and it's thought that the, the, um, an old older falling into river into a river gave man his first ideas for a canoe because it's very soft. You can carve it green, you can carve it out and you can make a canoe out of a piece of alder. And when you cut an alder, the, 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 the bit that's left, the stool as we call it, is, well, ye yellowy brown wood colour. And then quite rapidly, it produces this fantastic pigment, an orangey red pigment when it gets into contact with air. All round good tree, the older. Um, very good for making gunpowder as well, I'm told. Um, and then there are all sorts of other fantastic flora that all have, that at one point were really important to our whole folklore and our, you know, we didn't have medicines, we used what we had. There's, there's do you know bugle? It's a beautiful purple ground covering plant, bugle, nice spikes. It could be an orchid. It's pretty enough to be an orchid. And, um, it's also known as the, the carpenter's herb because it's quite good for cut fingers. But um, there, was a, there was a great herbalist by the name of Mrs. Grieve. I don't think she had a first name. She was just always known as Mrs. Grieve, who wrote in the 1930s. And she produced this herbal. And you I sort of imagined her as kind of like an upstanding member of the WI or something. She wrote about it. And she said about the bugle, she said it, it was the best narcotic in the world. But she didn't <laughs> go into any details. Um, 
Do you know, I think I've said enough now, haven't I? I've gone <laughs> on. I'm, I'm, I think you have to shut me up or I'll just go on. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Shall I stop? <laughs> Shall I stop and sure, take questions? Yeah, yeah I'll take... I can, I can pass my photos. I did f bring some image. I thought I'd do some image. Oh, I didn't mention the King Alfred's cakes, which is... <laughs> fungus on um, ash it likes d dying ash and that takes its name from I think you're on or, or, already it, it was when um, King Alfred was fighting the Vikings in the 800s he felt a bit tired popped into an old lady's house she was baking he asked he didn't recognize him as the king and she asked if he would look after her cakes he fell asleep worn out by battle the case got burnt ended up looking like that and um, yeah that's what I can't remember the rest of the story. I think I th maybe he used them as ammunition. There's a, an arum lily there. You've got the herb Paris. You've got the early purple orchid. You've got a beautiful brimstone. Brimstone butterfly was the um, inspiration for the name butterfly. The male is this fantastic yellow color. Butterfly. Here's a hazel and the wood anemones. And the older, the cut older. So <laughs> <laughs> Anne or James or, or Daniel? <coughs> can I ask uh, James and Daniel? How can you categorise the difference that you found between the four forests? Um, in what in what kind of way? Well, I'm not quite sure, to be absolutely honest. I mean, you 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 mentioned in the two extracts that you played for us mm -hmm. uh, that. This sounds very different, and uh, you know, I'm no musician, but to me, yes, it sounded very different. Yeah. But I, I couldn't categorise the difference, and I was wondering yeah. if you could. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean they're very different ecologically <coughs> for a start. Okay. Um, so Bedry Pinetum, for example, is almost like a kind of museum of trees in effect, and the area we were in uh, was the American section. So it was a very particular section of trees. We had right. t uh, two giant sequoias within the site. Um, so, and because each organism has a completely different composition, in a place like Bedbury, there's very little on the floor in terms of flora and that kind of thing. Um, Spatially, it was very different as well because you didn't have a lot on the ground and you had incredibly tall trees. Right. Um, so that was uh, that made a huge difference. Um, Thetford is a is the area we're in is in effect a man-made forest that isn't that old. Um, so that's what I was going yeah. that to say. The, both those would be planted. They've been planted. Yeah, they? exactly. Yeah. So as a result, the kind of um, the ecology actually isn't quite as rich. Fine shade is actually the best one in terms of mm. breadth of ecology. Um, and it was interesting to us how, I suppose, the visual aspect doesn't necessarily marry up. If you're just a general person who knows very yeah. little about it, it doesn't necessarily add up. So w within the piece, everything is uh, kind of balanced. So f uh, fungi is as important as a bird of prey or a deer, it's not kind of based on human experience of what humans like, it's to do with the roles they play within uh, the ecology and within the ecosystem. And the important thing is, of course, all of the ingredients of the composition, things that were common across all of the forests, were, would occur again and again. Mm. So things like decaying wood, the motif, because that was present in all the four forests, you would hear it across all the four, and the same with moss and fungus. But where you would hear it and the quantity of how much you would hear it would be different by virtue of what the survey told us. So, and so for example, in fine shade, we had red kites circling overhead. That would be completely unique so that, to that area yeah. because it wasn't occurring in any of the other forests. So that you would only hear in fine shade. Um, but the, the it's, you won't be able to see this very clearly, but we've actually got photo, photographic surveys, um, which we'd be happy to talk through these afterwards of each of the sites. So this is, metre by metre, every single one of the squares that we surveyed within each of the sites. So, so that's your um, 20 by 30? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And you can see the wood, there's a mud, the mud, there is the um, uh, mahonia that James was talking about, and then mm. it's difficult to see the trees, um, but the next the image... Wood for, shows yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then this shows you, I'm sorry if you can't see this, but I can show it in detail. This shows you how we then abstracted this and turned it into our service. So the peas are pine trees. So every pea that you can see in a circle is a pine tree. In circles we've got A's which are ash trees, and we've got hawthorn, uh, small pine, hazel, I think, and this again was in Thetford. And then we have the same photograph, and then a survey of, oh, which was this? This was fine shape, actually. 
So again, a lot of ash trees, um, uh, an oak tree, or a couple of oak trees, birch trees and so on. And then all of the, the background patterns that you can see is the ground flora. So uh, nettles and ivy and soil <laughs> and things like this. So, so go, going back to your question then, it, 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 the palette that we drew from was the same across each of the forests, but how much you heard each of those different species. So that the would balance be the, between the, the elements. The balance that between, yeah. yeah. Mm. Exactly. I think you said you'd sort of be on a test site at Thetford Forest where you are presumably did initial debugging and, and sort of fine tuning. After mm. that, do you then just move the installation and see what the sensor data creates, or do you, do you work with it? Well, in, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an, it's an interesting sort of problem that we've created for ourselves, in effect, because we had not... So Thetford, when we did the prototype, I think we assumed that kind of 90% of it would stay roughly the same from when we did the installation the following year, and that it wouldn't change hugely. In reality, we had to completely redo everything and resurvey it, uh, because things had changed so much. And actually, again, like visually, you wouldn't necessarily see that just from looking at it, but the moment you look at every single metre squared, you see just how much changes and how fast it changes. So in order for us to do any installation of this again, we have to survey in the same level of detail, in effect. Mm -hmm. Although we could take the piece and, uh, and do that, but everything would be off. So you don't, if there was a pine, just one pine tree over there in the corner, you would no longer hear the sound of that pine tree from there. You might just, it might just be randomly placed wherever if you took it from a previous forest, because mm -hmm. it's completely spatially mapped as well. And that's one of the really, uh, was one of the really fascinating things for us, because what it meant was that many people on many different levels, and Daniel mentioned this, but you know, you can have a child come in and you can say, well, go and find a pine tree and you'll hear the pine tree motif. And then they can learn that, and then they can find another pine tree and expect mm -hmm. it to be there and it will be there. And there's a kind of magic to that um, as a thing that's mm. quite important to the piece, I think. Yeah, definitely. In theory, in an ideal world, we would have taken the composition and just implanted it somewhere else. But in, in practice, you're, you, know, you have this level of perfectionism. You're listening to all day, and you reflect on it, and you want to change things about it. And one of the most profound changes, actually, that happened over the tour was that at first we went for quite a dense sound, so there would always be something musically going on, that you would always you know, be engaged by the composition. But the more we went on, the more we actually start to thin out the composition, so to reduce the number of elements that you would hear at once. And part of the motivation behind that was just the realisation that really the musical composition is only half of the piece, the other half is the sound of the forest itself, and it's really nice to be able to hear these gaps within mm -hmm. the music, and there would even be moments where it would just be silent for a few seconds. and. Uh, you know, it was those moments that really did make you kind of see how it sit within the real world environment as well. Um, and it, you, you mentioned the word debugging as well. So, because um, like one of the big issues for me doing technical kind of development and realization was for looking for you know glitches in the software and to understand if it was going to run stably and so forth. Which thankfully it did. I mean, it was it was a very much it had a life of its own, but it was the life that we'd intended to give it. But for the first time ever in the Thetford installation, we actually had an encounter of our very first real bug in that a spider somehow crawled behind the computer screen, mm -hmm. between the screen and the display behind it, crawled there, couldn't get out. And so for the rest oh. of the tour, we had a real bug in the system <laughs> for the duration of the tour, which I thought was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Will you um, uh, do this installation any more woods, or are you moving on to a different that's a good question. Um, <laughs> we're, well, we're currently kind of making plans for next year, basically, and thinking about that. We've both just been finishing PhDs, which were slightly on hold while we were touring and doing other things. But we, uh, well, Daniel's finished his, and I'm on my end stretch, basically. Um, so, yes, I think we'd really like to. It's quite, a, it's quite an undertaking to do a piece on this scale, and we were very lucky to have the opportunity to do it and tour it in that way. Um, and it's very difficult to come across the opportunity to do that, particularly because you're operating sort of outside of the normal realm of where art is shown. So mm -hmm. it's quite a big ask for people to take it on and to, uh, for people to come, in effect. Um, but we have talked a lot, we, we uncovered a lot within it, I think, um, and we've talked a lot about doing studies on smaller sort of subsets of the ecosystem mm -hmm. and on different uh, 
naturally occurring systems, we've got a kind of list of things that we want to make. Is that fair to say? <laughs> a big list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it's difficult because you don't want to... Like, we're, we're both kind of fascinated by a lot of different areas of the world around us, so, so the piece that we went on to develop after Living Symphonies was actually all about human systems, so it was looking at the world of the internet and ways in which we can take conversations that happen on forums and social networks and things like that and then try to pull apart bits of those and find uh, accidental poetry and ways in which you can actually understand all of these human interactions as a part of a big you know potential sort of pool of composition compositional material so it might not be might not necessarily be animal ecosystems but I think there's a lot of different you know, areas of the world around us that we think you can, you know, t turn this ki same kind of lens onto, um, yeah, the sky is one that we've been thinking a lot about, actually, for a potential mm. piece. Might be upcoming. Um, can I ask you a question? Um, yes. I was very interested earlier, we had a very brief conversation about um, a particular crop and um, a Goya painting that yes. has indicated some detail mm. about this crop. And I was just wondering whether th there are more examples of kind of historical works of art that reveal information about um, you know, agriculture and ecology and things that we haven't quite understood or tell you something, you would love to come to, um, uh, where, where I work, the, the John Innes, we have what's called a special collection, which is some rare botanical, but a priceless collection of rare botanical books. I think the, the, the earliest one goes to the 1500s, you know, and they, they like, might, might be the only copy they're hand, they were hand drawn. And there, it sounds like some real insights into um, plant biology of plants that, you know, you think, oh, that was way ahead of its time. You look at some of the, uh, the drawings and how they interpreted it. And the, but um, th they are, although you get, like, what, what the truth, you get, they're, a, they're, a, they're sort of a curious amalgam of fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there's, some, there's some fantastic, well, the, the, the um, I I'm trying to remember the, um, oh, I can't remember the, there's one, that, the, the, one of the earliest ones shows a, a, a true scientific, what, what was held as true, a scientific drawing of a mandrake. Do you know Han Harry Potter? Have you heard Mama Harry yeah. Potter? I mean, you know the mandrake. Um, uh, but it, it is probably, it is a proper plant. It's a plant of the, of the Mediterranean, uh, related to the potato. And um, in, uh, in the 1500s, it was highly valued because the root was, uh, was, was, was like a cure-all for everything. It was like really, really valuable, the root of the mandrake. And um, the, but but is, is, is um, but the the problem was that that um, that when you that they thought that in, in the in the drawing of it there is underground is a person, it's like the root is a person, and they then they they said that if you they pulled the mandrake out and you heard the mandrake scream you'd be dead in oh. it would be dead in twenty four hours you heard them, so the and the the, the but this book tells you how to harvest your mandrake without killing yourself. And just <laughs> quite it. You tie the, the leash of a sturdy dog to the um, top of the mandrake, and then you tempt the dog away with a little bit of food. And it's to say, you know, you're likely to lose the dog, but such was the, <laughs> such was the worth of the mandrake root. It was, you know, it was, it, the, value, it was the value of the dog was nothing compared <laughs> to... But, um, but then, yeah, in, it was at least in, in Norfolk, um, you know, they, they were quite good on counterfeit, uh, forging. I thought, oh, come on, mandrake, I can make it, you know, it looks like a little person. I can make one. And they used to carve, um, do you know, um, bryony, white bryony twining up through the hedgerows is the berries, that the red, do you see it? Like now it's in berries. Do you know white bryony? Mm -hmm. It has, if you, if you, you don't normally see it, but if you were to pull it up, it has this massive root like a parsnip. And they used to carve the root of the briny to make it look like a mountain, pass it off as a mandrake. <laughs> There's only one problem, is the root of the briny is very, very poisonous. <laughs> so, so they used to, yeah. And I've got, um, I've got an allotment, and the, um, so someone else on the allotment, new, I'll say new to gardening, I'll say, uh, <laughs> had sown a couple of rows of parsnips and um, gone away, left it, come back in November to harvest the parsnips. Thought, oh well, yeah, here they are. This is where I dug them up, not realizing he's actually dug up 
a load of bryony roots. They looked like a parsnip. Took it home, and they made a they made a a, 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 cas a slow a slow uh, the cas casseroled it, put it in with a load, and they used a lot of I don't know, steak or something in there. I mean, the wife. Oh yeah, you know, here's my beautiful vegetables I've grown. This made this nice stew. So it's tucked in. Uh, three days later, I think they were just about able to get out of bed and get themselves to the doctor. And they said, well, what have you eaten? And, and um, they had a little bit of the parsnip left. And uh, so they sent me the photograph. I said, it's briny root. It's briny root. You know, you could, and if they hadn't done the slow cooking for, for the, however long it was, 18 hours, they would be dead. And they'd used the briny root. Where was I going with the story? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, yeah, the um, special collection. Anyway, there's lots of examples like that, you know. Um, uh, uh, Malpighian in the 1600s was, was showing uh, uh, broad beans with root nod, bacterial root nod, long before anybody knew about nitrogen fixation. They were growing them, you know. They, did, they, they, were, they were drawing what they saw, and it was true, to, apart from the mandrake, true to, true to four. There's lots of, there's the barnacle geese as well. That was the, there was a, there was a, um, uh, because the, the culp have that I think that was no Gerard Gerard had poo poo by the eight, this 1800s he was poo pooing the mandrake you know there's no one down there there isn't a person down there it's not but he he fully upheld the the story of the barnacle geese and that's because their breeding grounds are way out in the Arctic nobody saw the young barnacle the chicks they never saw the ch the chicks but the barnacle geese just kind of came in with the driftwood and the, and the old bits of shipwreck and stuff. And they thought, they, oh, they've come out of the barnacles. They've come out of the, sticking to the wood. That's what they and that was um, carried on for far longer than it should. There it is in the Gerard's Herbal, the barnacle geese. But, you know, it was, it was kept going by the Catholic Church because the geese came out, they weren't, they weren't born of flesh, they were born of bits of old rotting woods, they could eat them on a Sunday. They kept that going <laughs> far longer. So then there's lots of, but, there's, but there are two things, but there is some fiction as well in there, yeah. Did that answer the question? I can't remember now, what was the question? <laughs> well, did that get somewhere close? James, I can't when remember. When you were doing the research for the, um, for the compositions, the sound, deciding what instruments um, mm -hmm. to use for the different species, did you ever, did you come across any folklore like this that? Decision in because you mentioned the magpie being inspired by kind of automatic instruments. Yeah. Of so how many <coughs> of these um, examples of folklore kind of run through or you recognise them from? Yeah, the, the, the and it's it was inc an incredibly kind of rich resource in a way to kind of think about how to uh, how to go about that. So we thought about kind of witch hazel and things like that, and that sort of notion in the way that hazel was composed. Um, it's a, it, it was always a kind of balancing act, basically, between kind of three things, the ecological reality of it, the sort of characteristics of how these things behave and what they physically are, um, the way that anyone in this room might understand that thing and trying to make that link between an unknown person listening and uh, the music chosen and the way it works to kind of draw from that. So you know a certain amount of things about your audience, you know that they've probably heard Vivaldi and uh, watched Fantasia, or, you know, there's a certain musical knowledge that everyone has, so there's a level of that. And then uh, the other really kind of wonderful bit of it, which was a bit of a rabbit hole to go down within this, was, uh, yeah, all, all of the mythology and talking to various people um, about things. So, yeah, it's kind of a combination of all of that, um, probably more erring towards the actual ecology side of it in the end, because uh, it fitted best with the concept and because it's not a conventional piece of narrative music as such. Does that answer? Yes. Cool. And one thing I particularly enjoyed when I experienced living symphonies was the sense of the layering within the ecology and um, walking around um, suddenly being aware that there might be something at my feet mm. or into another space and thinking and it opens up and thinking there's something above me or could be something above me and I really love that that you kind of really pulled out the depth of, of the forest. The, this was one of the things that I was um, pondering actually just when James was talking about that because it's true of any real ecosystem that it has its own kind of acoustic spectrum so um, if you 
put some microphones around a forest, you will actually hear these layers coming out because, of course, larger creatures tend to be closer to the earth. So, you, you know, your, your, your red deers and your badgers and things like this are lower down. Um, and then as you go further up through the trees, you get smaller and smaller, higher-pitched creatures effectively appearing and, you know, the surfaces of trees. You get uh, beetles and crickets and uh, so on and so forth. Bats. And so bats. And bats. Oh, yeah, well, of course, yeah. yeah. Well, we haven't even oh, yeah, we didn't night, talk night about yeah. event, but, um, mm. Yeah. yeah, it was quite so. So also informing the sound of each of these creatures was this kind of tacit understanding of bioacoustics. You know, if a creature is large, you're not expecting it to make a <laughs> sound. You know, it's going to be a bit more booming, and so I think this mm. fed into this as well. Um, but yeah, the night we did a nighttime event, yeah. um, Fine Shade, which was magical and again a really interesting yeah. way to listen yeah. because it's rare that you're sitting listening to the sound materializing all around you in almost pitch blackness. Um, and that was one of the few times that we got to hear the compositions for bats and owls. Yeah, this is a funny thing that happened with this tour where we, we made all of it and then sort of didn't think or realise that obviously most of these forests don't open in, in the evening or at night. So we didn't hear any of that stuff mostly. So we'd done all of that work to, uh, yeah. to create all of that stuff and to have that beautiful moment of dusk when... Because the forest really, really changes at dusk. Mm -hmm. And it's a very beautiful thing within the piece when that happens. Um, but it wasn't until yeah, probably quite late in Thetford, the first installation where, like towards the end of the week, where we had one night walk, which was the first time we got to hear anything of that kind, really. Mm. Um, which is a shame, because in a way it would be brilliant yeah. if it was a 24-hour constant piece, because then you would really get the ebb and flow of all of it. Because, of course, forests aren't <coughs> paying attention to day or night in the same way that we do. Yes. <laughs> oh, you're on to a pet subject <laughs> now. <laughs> I, I was quite surprised to learn how much tree roots really do depend on fungi to survive. Yeah. And I've always thought, because I don't know if this is true or not, I've heard that there's more bacteria in the human body than there is cells with our DNA, and we are equally dependent on them for digestion. And I thought there's an interesting parallel there. And what do you think about symbiosis? We have to go back 130 million years. <laughs> Prebiotic spook, nothing would have evolved had it not been for the fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi enabled plants to merge out of the soup and live on land. They couldn't have done it without the fungi, and they still rely. We know so little about what's going on underneath that, the soil. That, that's where you need to go down, and uh, you have to. There's a whole other world down there that we know nothing about, very little about. But yeah, yeah, mycorrhizal, fantastic. And they. I was, they communicate. They communicate with. They do communicate with with the tr with all all. Um, well, mo okay, not all. Di most plants have some sort of mycorrhizal interaction, and they they have to know that it's the right fungus. They can't have any old fungus interacting with them. They have to letting them in because they don't. They don't. They s they actually the roots actually intertwine, and sometimes they do sort of actually get, they do get into the plant roots as well. So you can't have any old fungus getting into your roots because you're going to end in disaster. But and they do communicate, and they, they it's very very subtle. They send out signalling molecules. There's a whole signalling system that we're only now beginning to um, understand. Well, and mm -hmm. partially understand how they communicate and how the plants, the trees communicate in between and that would be a fantastic symphony you know, symbiosis <laughs> symphony you got to say fantastic um, and you can actually see um, you can measure the signaling with like a pulse like a beating heart in the plant fantastic it's an electrical signal um, it's based on, um, a, it was kind of like a calcium iron so it's, it, it is yeah a, a moving signal um, uh, yeah Kind of electrical, yeah. And so does, does yeah. each individual plant have its own kind of fungal signature? If yep, you like, yeah. Two exactly the same species of plant, they have a totally. They no, they they would probably have a very similar signature, oh. but different plants would vary. Different species would vary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you begin to condense all of that complexity into? A computer program because um, what I'm interested to know is you said you had to kind of you couldn't have every single species of uh, beetle because I mean the 
happen in loads of people. Out there. So how do you kind of pare down and really selectively choose those elements to kind of quantify the it's, program? It's a really, really good question, and it's a, a difficult one. And certainly, we became quite surprised when we discovered that the the kind of model that we were building goes way beyond even the models that you know an ecological scientist would produce to understand an ecosystem because it doesn't tend to be the case that you do everything at once it tends to be that if you're looking at fungus you will model fungus and you will take this very very focused um kind of zoomed in view of a species or of a part of an ecosystem and what we were trying to do was a a bit more of like a kind of um kind of bricolage in that we were both looking at these kind of patchworky ground species, the distinct trees, and then also all of the individuals that live within that. And as you say, there would be, you know, hundreds of thousands of organisms living within the area of forest that we were looking at. And so very quickly we realized it would be foolish to try and mirror that. But what we did was we took um, some, some some artistic license in grouping together species, as James said, so we took beetles and we took spiders. But we also modeled them not as individuals, but as kind of colonies. So you would um, understand where and when these species it would be likely to be active, and it would create a kind of almost like a cloud of organisms within the area that would then throb and pulse and expand. Um, and then you would hear that same kind of pulsing throughout that area of the forest for a while. And to an extent, that was to do with the kind of computational feasibility um, of actually being able to realize this thing. But also in terms of um, attention and audience engagement, you, you would you become quite fatigued. I think if you're actually listening to a perfect representation of what's going on within the forest, mm -hmm. you would more or less be listening to a drone with variations. And what we wanted to do was create something that has a little bit more structure and movement um, musically within it. So we devised a system that would effectively focus temporarily on different parts of the ecosystem. So it would take the model and then it would zoom in on the species which might be ecologically dominant at one period of time. And then you would hear those come through within the composition for a period, and then for a while, and then after a while, it would change its focus to a different area of the ecosystem. So there were kind of two different ways that we were trying to accomplish that. One was practical, and one was a bit more in terms of the kind of the experiential kind of view of the composition. Mm -hmm. So who's the guy with the conductor's bat on in this? <laughs> is, it, is it you? Is it nature? Is it the computer program? <laughs> is it the set of conditions in which it happens to be by the time? Who, who kind of owns that particular iteration of the work when you, when you what owns it? Who is the composer? <laughs> That's a very deep question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if we've achieved what we're aiming at, the ecosystem in combination, in, in the broadest possible sense, including uh, the weather, but then obviously there's a level of authorship because it wouldn't be there otherwise. It's, it doesn't grow from nothing, that, and you have to accept that. Um, but also it's quite an interesting sort of scenario because it, it uh, doesn't exist past the point that it exists, if you see what I mean, so it runs and then it's over when we take uh, all of the equipment out and it doesn't exist again. There's no way of really documenting it. And then you move to another site and it will be completely different and made completely differently for that site. And it will never ever kind of be an object as such. So thinking about ownership or authorship of it or I don't know, there's all sorts of problems. We've had chats with people about kind of buying editions of it and it's such mm -hmm. a it's actually just impossible. We've created a slightly yeah. impossible thing to go anywhere near that sort of route, which isn't a problem. It's just quite interesting. Mm. Well, I think I think the conductor's baton is is a really mm. kind of instructive metaphor in terms of the way that the piece can be seen, because it would be naive of us to say we've perfectly represented the ecosystem. It is our interpretation. You know, it's our framing of it. We've composed the work and so forth, and so we would be, in the classical sense, the composers. But in the same way. The conductor on the day is the one that influences the dynamics of the piece and the feel of it and the flow and how and, and, and the musicians for that matter as well. And I think that's that's quite a useful distinction really mm. for the composers then nature of the system itself is the conductor. And that's is really it nice. the weather? And the weather, yeah, yeah. of course, uh, yeah. Yeah. But then if you do I mean yeah. it's not all that different to 
sorry, just think about what you just said, but it's not all that different to an orchestra. If you play in an orchestra, you adjust to the player sitting next to you, adjust to minute changes all around you, to the acoustic of the room. If it's hot, you play in a different way. Your violin might change its tuning. Mm. You know, it's not, it's not the notes written on the page that get played. It's all of that. Mm. And that's always kind of been the case, I think. Mm. Um, yeah. So the music changes in real time. Mm -hmm. So what are the instruments that you use to gather the sort of real time information? So in terms, of, in terms of what sort of drives the piece, um, there's a weather station uh, monitoring weather conditions. So I think it's eight or nine parameters constantly. So humidity, second by second, that sort of thing. Um, and that has an influence upon the computer software, which is a simulation of the whole forest that has um, all of uh, the organisms that are acti uh, active at that time placed within it. And then that triggers the composition to play the relevant bits in the relevant spaces over a 24-channel speaker system. And those things are uh, recorded in, if you imagine it, like hundreds and hundreds of tiny fragments of sound played on mainly acoustic instruments, actually, in the instance of this piece for each organism. It's, a, it's kind of reordering that to create the music in different ways. in December, but we will be returning in January, um, intending to do arts and citizenship. So um, if you would like to take part in that or want to learn more, uh, there's a bit on feedback sheets to put the name down for our new sector, and any other feedback you can provide, really, really helpful. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> didn't move on too long, I don't need, I barely began, I thought, oh, I better wind up. That was totally, that was I better wind up before I uh, dominate. Yeah. Yeah. It just, you know, it's just like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, that would be, if we could have had that, it would have been fantastic. Mm. Yeah.